Uh, welcome everyone to Getting Ahead by Deleting Code. Pop quiz. What's this session about? It's about getting ahead. Okay, keep that in mind. <laughs> Some people uh, were contacting me going, I'm really excited about your talk on optimizing PowerShell. It's like, well, come. Anyway, uh, this is about, this is a career talk. This is a mentorship talk. This is about getting ahead while you're deleting the code. How about forwards? Forwards works better than backwards when you're on the first slide. I'm Thomas Rayner. I work at Microsoft. I work on a security and privacy team that provides support to uh, about 400 different microservices uh, that support Teams and Skype and different messaging infrastructure. Uh, you can find me all kinds of places. Uh, so I made thomasrayner.ca slash find me. I've been getting quite, are you on Twitter still? Are you on Mastodon? Or can I email you? You can even message me on Teams if you so want to. We're openly federated. There's nothing stopping you from uh, contacting Satya directly other than uh, the likely consequences of that choice. <laughs> uh, but thomasrainer.ca slash find me. Anywhere that I look forward to hearing from people, uh, you can find from me out there. And then also let's have a little level setting here. There's a lot of folks who uh, are of an ops background. They write PowerShell, but they go, oh, I'm not a dev. Oh, devs test their code. No, I don't do that. <laughs> devs check their code into Git. I don't do that. Uh, let's be very clear. If you write code, you're a dev. And also I'll add on to this. If you have knowledge, you're a mentor. And you might go, oh, I'm not a mentor. I don't have like a direct report that I meant. I don't meet with people all the time. Yes, you are still a mentor though. So level set. You're a dev and you're a mentor. I'm sorry to break it to some of you, but it's true. Let's talk quickly. Uh, how do some people measure developer impact? What is the value of a dev? Because you're all devs. I just told you, you've all written code. I'm sure you're at a PowerShell conference. You probably opened up the prompt and at least written a line in there. So how do people measure the value to their organization of you, a developer? Uh, good metrics are related to the problem that is solved by something that you write. So that's, what did you make faster? What did you make safer? Whose life did you improve? Uh, what, what was the impact of the code that you wrote, right? Bad metrics, bad ways of evaluating the impact of a developer are related to the code itself. So like, how many lines of code did you write? How many commits did you write? Right, like these are, hey, you could write a million lines of code that all say hello world, and hey great, you wrote a million lines of code. That's not necessarily a good way to measure how valuable a dev is to an organization. So naturally, we're gonna talk about that last one. Uh -huh. um, I'm measuring a little funny though. I've written a net negative lines of PowerShell in my career. How is that possible? You write 100 lines of code and there you go. Even if you come back and delete 50, that's still a net of 50, right? Like, so, okay, how are you counting this? Like I just said, when you're refactoring old code, like you still, how do you ever get below zero? That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Like. You wrote code, you deleted code, you're still above zero. When you start helping others optimize their code and not just refactoring your code, suddenly, okay, I wrote 100, I deleted 50, I'm down to 50, and then they wrote 100 and I helped them delete 50, now I'm down to zero. You sort of see where we're going with this? It's not just about your code, but helping other people uh, make improvements to their code. When you start deleting not just your code, but other people's code. Why would I want to delete code at all? Right? Like, I thought this was all about writing code. I'm a developer. I produce code. But better code tends to, this is a rule of thumb, tends to be fewer lines of code. Uh, and I'm not talking about code golf. 
uh, which I think there's a session on, which is, is really interesting to exploit the language and do weird things and use aliases and try to write the fewest characters to accomplish a goal. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about deleting code just so that it's small. But when you write a more concise script, when you uh, write code that has less complexity, it tends to be better. When you write things that are a little more modularized, performant and tests well, um, you tend to write more concise solutions. When you're just starting out though, let's talk about beginner habits. When you're, like everybody in here has written their first line of code. It might've been this week, it might've been 10 years ago, might've been when they were first introducing code. But everyone was a beginner at some point. Tell me if this is relatable. You have a task, I'm gonna write some code for it. I don't know how to write code. Go on your favorite search engine, which is obviously Bing, and you go, how do I write whatever the code is that I'm trying to do? And you find a Stack Overflow question that was answered, you find a blog post that somebody wrote, you found a TechNet article, and you went, select, copy, paste, oh, that ran, I'm a dev, awesome. That's sort of beginner habits. And well, I needed not just to do this first thing, I needed to do this other thing too. So, oh, I don't know how to do the other thing either. So you go back on to Bing, you type in the other thing and you sort of copy paste and you merge it all together and you have this brickwork kind of uh, script uh, that, hey, it accomplishes the goal. It might not perform very well. It might not look very good. It might not be tested or in source control, but it worked. You're a beginner, you're starting out, that's okay. That's, and that's not a criticism of beginners. We were all beginners, and most of us didn't just start with amazing code quality. So what is beginner code quality? It's not usually great. It's usually a little bit spaghetti. It's a little bit um, hodgepodged together. And again, that's fine. That's not a criticism. That's where you start. That's where you begin writing code. But how do you grow from there? How, how did you think about yourself? How did you go from that point where you're copying and pasting blindly from Stack Overflow or from TechNet or from blogs or wherever to, hey, I can just know how to do this now. I've learned the concept. I'm not just blindly doing this. I'm not just borrowing the work of others like any other good developer would. How did you actually progress? Odds are you had some mentors along the way, whether you realized it or not. That might be a direct relationship with somebody who had been at your company longer. That might be somebody on the PowerShell Discord who answered questions that you brought them and asked. That might be the person whose blog you kept finding you go back to over and over again because, boy, it just seems like they're doing your career six months ahead of you. Like, those people are all mentors to you. You're standing on their shoulders to use what they're teaching you to advance your career. And that's awesome. That's growth. You're using those contributions other people have made. And so, I've already told you, you're a mentor, obviously, because you have knowledge. And against your best efforts, maybe, you're probably sharing that knowledge with people. Whether they ask you a question, whether you took on to Twitter or you made your own blog, whatever. Um, if you have some knowledge, you have it to share. If you're a senior person in your career, mentorship is probably on your radar. It's probably a goal that your boss has given you to mentor the junior person and help bring them up to speed. It's part of your job title. Maybe if you're the new person on your team, you're the junior person who just came out of college or out of wherever else, um, and you're, they're hoping you'll bring fresh energy, and even there's a senior person on the team, you can teach them this. The point is, you're either a, acknowledging the fact that you're a mentor, or you're doing it organically anyway, whether you want to call it that or not. So you're definitely already a mentor. As you grow, you write more efficient solutions, right? Where did you learn what you know? You learned it from people's blogs, you learned it um, through searching online, you learned it through talking with your coworkers. So the next question is, how are you passing that knowledge on? Are you doing it actively? Do you have a social media presence? Do you have a blog? Are you having meetings with people? Like, what are you doing? To, as you're standing on the shoulders of people who helped you grow, uh, how are you helping people stand on your shoulders and achieve even more? And also, how is this related to my career development? Because we're increasing your impact. We're increasing your value as a developer 
by making the people around you better. This is the getting ahead part. This isn't just about being a rock star who writes great code. It's about being the person who makes an entire team of people write better code. I should have hit that earlier and made my point there. So let's revisit the original question again, right? So we want to get ahead in our careers. We want to have a greater impact because that's your, we're, everybody works for a boss who measures dev uh, impact correctly, right? Nobody's sitting there answering like, oh yeah, they measure lines of code. If, if you are, that's an opportunity to have that conversation and go, this isn't an effective metric for measuring my performance. We should think about another way to do that. Lines of code is a poor metric, I told you that. So if I wanted to have that conversation with my boss, if they are measuring the lines of code or the tickets closed and it's not very meaningful, be proactive, have that conversation. It's like, this is not an accurate reflection of who I am to this company. You might bump into the response of like, hey, I wanna help, uh, I wanna write more code, I wanna have this opportunity to do this, I wanna work with whoever, and you might be met with, that's not a dev, that's a junior ops person. They, oh, you're not a dev, you're an ops person. Or you might even be saying within yourself, I don't know how to write code very well. Like, I'm just kind of noodling through this. I'm here hoping to learn how to write better code. Um, make better devs. Uh, it, it's hard to hire people, right? Like, even in a job market where there's lots of people looking for jobs or they're looking for a remote job because their current job isn't remote, whatever, um, it's always effective to uh, make the people who are already there better. You've already onboarded them. There's a huge investment people have when they bring people on board. It's always more economical to make the people you have better rather than to bring in a hired gun or something like that. Plus it's more sustainable. If they're growing where they're at, they're more likely to stay. And that's probably important to you as a person who's maybe also planning on staying there. So you're gonna be a mentor. I've told you like five or six times already. Um, we're gonna talk now about the different types of mentoring relationships. Because you might be sitting there going like, okay, I guess he's right, I do have knowledge. Uh, oh, every now and then I do answer a question. But in the interest of that getting ahead in your career thing, we need to be a little more proactive and engaged about the whole endeavor. We need to be a little bit more mindful of what it is we're doing to be mentors. That will make us much more effective. And so it's worth reflecting what is your mentorship style? You may have never thought about that before. It's akin to also, what is your learning style? How do you like to communicate with people? There's so many different kinds of mentoring relationships, whether it's an official thing with the junior person on your team or your boss is the mentor and you're the mentee. There's lots of unofficial ways where oh, I just talk on Twitter a lot and I seem to help people or I found the PowerShell help uh, hashtag or something and I'm good there too. I go on the PowerShell uh, Git repo, GitHub repo, and I answer questions that are in the issues. That is all mentorship. That is all helping people grow. And so what do you like? Do you like those uh, experiences that are more organic and on your own terms and just kind of as they pop up? Or do you like the structure that comes with uh, a formal relationship? It's also a good idea to be flexible on this because uh, different people have different styles of learning. Just because you prefer one type of mentoring relationship doesn't mean everyone is gonna prefer that as well. Uh, people have different styles of learning, whether that's uh, like auditory, you may have heard these terms before, audio learners, visual learners, uh, kinesthetic learners, that's when you get your hands on it and tear it apart. You might be the type of person who goes, oh yeah, I just love, oh just give me the code, I don't wanna listen to this guy talk anymore, I just wanna like, tell me where to download the module and I'll figure it out. Not everybody's like that. Some people wanna watch the video, some people wanna to listen to the podcast, and so it's worth reflecting on what your own preferences are and being mindful of what the preferences are of others that you're engaging with. In those limited, organic, kind of as they come up conversations, uh, like if you're on the Discord and somebody asks a question, it's not a huge, uh, hugely difficult thing to answer. You're already engaged with them in a way that they've chosen to engage with you. Uh, but if you're having that more deliberate uh, purposeful, uh, official mentorship and re relationship, you should be really thoughtful about that because if all you do is send somebody links and all they want to do is get their hands on the keyboard, 
you're, you're disconnected. So they have different ways they like to learn, different ways they like to communicate. Uh, for me personally, uh, I like the organic sort of um, unofficial uh, get your hands dirty thing, bump into somebody in the hallway and they tell you about something they're working on and oh, let me download that and try it. Um, I like to relate to people casually rather than formally, but that's me. That's not necessarily you. That's not necessarily everybody you're going to interact with either. And so uh, it, you, you can have your preferences and that's good. And your preferences matter because those are more likely your strengths. But knowing what the strengths and preferences are of the people that you're interacting with is really valuable as well. This is a two player system here. And if, you, if you're a disconnect and you just can't make it work, maybe the best thing you can do for them is uh, connect them with somebody who's more their learning style who's more their, the right teacher for them. That they'll remember that you were honest and helpful, even if it wasn't necessarily you who was most helpful to them. So learning style is important. Knowing how you like to interact with people is important. Let's talk about some actual tangible ideas that you can do. You can start, I think, every single one of these today. You can skip all the free alcohol and then go back to your room and start doing these right now. Maybe not. But these are all things that uh, don't cost a lot of money to start doing. These are all things that are accessible to pretty much anybody who has knowledge, which you all do. Code reviews. Code reviews are not just change control. They are a mentorship opportunity and they're enormously valuable. Of course, all the code that everybody in this room writes before it goes to prod, it's reviewed, right? And I see a lot of liars. <laughs> no, but so it's change control. Obviously, that's a primary value of reviewing code is to make sure that you didn't embed a password in there and that you didn't um, make something that's going to take down your most important line of business apps and stuff like that. But when we're thinking about it, not just in that change control mindset, but also in the uh, mentorship opportunity aspect, what, what can we do? How do we, how do we frame this that way? Uh, the first thing, you have to be thorough. There's a recurring theme with this mentorship uh, thing is that you must be engaged. There is not a shortcut to helping somebody. It's not just about throwing links over the fence. It's about building a connection with somebody, even if it's fleeting and brief, but being deliberate and in a code review, thorough. You need to understand their code and understand it in context. Is this gonna run on a Linux system or a Windows system? What dependencies are gonna need to be on that server and are they already going to be there? Are you checking for them? Um, what are your priorities with this code? Function's important. Having the code being maintainable is important. Having the code be performant and optimized is important. What order are those priorities in for this particular piece of code? And thinking about that when you're reviewing it. Because you might have an idea about how they could optimize, you have 10 lines here, this could be one line. But if the more important thing is that you can read it clearly, then maybe that's not worth making the change, right? Again, the point is to be thorough and to be mindful of, like think about like you're the interpreter running this thing line by line and how is this gonna work? It's not just about rubber stamping, saying, oh yeah, I know Thomas, Thomas writes great code. Uh, good, go to prod. It's about taking the time out of your day, focusing on this and making sure it's a priority because mentorship matters. Uh, one of the great things you can do, uh, an awesome technique, is to ask questions instead of just making statements. Asking questions like, uh, why did you choose to do this? Versus, you shouldn't have done this. Right? Like These are small human things that make you more relatable. These are things that make it a little bit more accessible. And maybe the person whose code you're reviewing can explain their thought process. And you can step through it. Oh, I see why you thought that, but... Or, ah, I didn't think of it that way. I didn't know this about your context, et cetera. Asking questions is way more productive than just telling them the answer. Um, even if that question is, have you considered? Uh, give me back my slides. There we go. Um, articulating uh, the problem as well as suggesting the alternative. It is not productive to just go, this is bad. 
It's not productive to just write a comment that says, oof, oh, no, right? And not saying anybody in here would ever do that, but like that's not helpful. And you may have been on the receiving end of a comment like that, and you're just going like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, the big part of this too is uh, making suggestions about what they can do differently. Hey, uh, will you put um, equals null instead of null equals your thing? Um, here's why you might consider doing it the other way because type coercion, blah, 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 blah. Uh, being explanatory and actually not just telling them the answer, but telling them why the answer. Focusing on their understanding and their learning and their growth is hugely uh, important. Because uh, they're going to learn something from your code review either way. They're either going to learn the right way to write some code, some things that they could correct and work on, or they're going to learn that you don't care and that you're just there to get through this code review and move on to the next thing. And sometimes you need to just get through the code review and move on to the next thing. We're all busy, um, but they're going to take something away from this experience. Either that, hey, it's really easy to get code past this person, or they actually care about me uh, learning. They're actually giving me more reading I can do, more resources on this thing that I clearly struggle with because I wrote the code wrong, things like that. Uh, you must, uh, if at all possible, highlight wins as well as correcting problems. If you see uh, something that, hey, I corrected them on this before, and they did it right this time, put a comment in there. Oh, great job. You took to the thing we talked about last time, keep doing this. Or even just if it wasn't something we talked about already. It's not all about correcting problems, but also encouraging good behavior. It's so easy to go through a piece of code and say, oh, that's not great. Oh, I don't understand why you did that. But keeping in mind also, oh, that's really awesome. That thing, I want you to do so much more of that. You wrote a regular expression instead of 16 different split operations. Awesome, good job. I can tell you didn't necessarily know regex when you started, but you know some now, and that's really good. Keep doing that encouragement. Again, this is a human thing, right? And speaking of it being a human thing is follow up. If you uh, review a 100 line script and you left 84 comments, you might take the human step of messaging that person or popping by their office or contacting them casually and going, hey, I left you some comments on your pull request. If you have any questions about them, let's set up some time or just come talk to me. I want to make sure that you understand everything I'm saying. Again, it's a little bit of hand holding. It's a little bit, I don't want to say kid gloves because that's a little condescending, but it's the gentler like, hey, if you just go look at 84 comments on 100 lines of code, oh, wow, I just got ripped apart. Oh, wow, this person hates how I write code. But if you follow it up, they'll get that impression that, oh, this is person's actually accessible. They do actually want to talk to me about this. They aren't just making me feel bad about myself. They want to collaborate and they, ha they care. Um, also, if they go back and fix all your problems and they ask you a question in one of the comments about clarifying and you don't ever respond because I already reviewed their code. Well, how, how are they learning from that too? So again, code reviews, great opportunity because you have a really strong mechanism to force this mentorship opportunity. If you're gonna deploy code of pride, it needs to be reviewed, otherwise we've been over that being important. Uh, you just have this mentorship opportunity built into your change management process, built into your act of working. You have this opportunity to talk about every piece of code that either of you write. Um, it goes the other way too. Maybe you're on a hypothetical two-person team and you're reviewing all of their code, giving them all of this knowledge. When they review your code, this is an opportunity to show them how you write code and these things that you might want them to notice about your code. And when they review your work as well, this is a learning opportunity again for both sides. Code reviews. Uh, group learning activities can be really powerful and you go, what the heck is a group learning activity? This is the act of solving problems together. Um, and often it's valuable if these problems are limited somehow or contrived in a way where it's very simple input, you have to write some code, simple output, especially with people who are at the very beginning of their development career. Um, I call out uh, leak code, advent of code. These are uh, like puzzle sites, if you aren't familiar with them. They say, given this input, write some code, 
produce the output, and we'll tell you if the output's right. And if you're just getting started, it can be really valuable to start on, hey, find the middle of this string. Find the um, seventh prime number in a list of random numbers, uh, things like that. Rather than, hey, write the entire suite to onboard a new employee. Oh, man. Especially in PowerShell. Um, hey, we have a new employee. We want to automate this. That's like the hello world of DevOps for a lot of people. Um, this is something that I had a ton of success with. Uh, my first team at Microsoft, I was brought on uh, largely to help uh, a group of ops people learn development skills. They were great ops people. They had great security knowledge, uh, but they just weren't doing a lot of automation. They weren't writing a lot of code. Um, and then once they started, we needed a little bit more maturity around development practices. Even at Microsoft, this is a thing that uh, you run into. Uh, and this was phenomenally valuable to be able to set some time aside. We did it weekly, and then we moved to twice weekly. You find a cadence that works for you, but you go, you start, here's the problem. You all go off. Maybe write your own solutions as well. Come back in your next regular meeting. Okay, so this was the problem. Everybody uh, wrote some code to find the middle of the string, just like the problem said. Uh, now let's go over everybody's solution and talk about it. And again, you have to keep in mind what are your goals here. The goal isn't to find the middle of the string. The goal isn't to solve all the easy problems on leak code. The goal is to make the people around you better. Right? So you can't lose sight of that. You can't just lecture, like I'm doing to you all now. Uh, you can't just, hey, okay, we'll find the middle of the string. Here's the solution. Everybody get that? All right, see you next week. That's not productive. That's not engaged. That's not that deliberate mentorship. Uh, so I'm sharing personal success. You can find your own thing that works. But uh, all right, so let's go around the table. And how did you do it? Put it up on the screen and we're equipped for that. And oh, we'll talk about your solution. Here's what I like, here's what I didn't like. Okay, next person, et cetera. Go through everyone's solution, talk about what was good, what was bad, and then share yours as well because they should see uh, if you had something radically different or everyone came up with the same. But again, this isn't just you showing off. This isn't just a one-to-many relationship. It is a collaborative. Often, they learn more from each other than they learn from me because they actually spent time online looking up different unique solutions to these relatively trivial problems that I didn't even think about. Uh, oh, it turns out there is a library that just finds the middle of strings or whatever, and you could just use that instead of writing your own algorithm, uh, et cetera. Uh, and the, so again, this is collaborative, this is great if you're doing it one-on-one, -on -one. this is great if you're doing it with a team of people, um, it's, it's really flexible. There's a world of options you can find out there other than leak code and other than code and stuff. Uh, there, there's time. You can make up your own problems that are maybe rele more relevant to your team. What you run into is it's great to have a trivial problem, but if you can't connect that to the work you're actually doing, that can be a little hard sometimes. So you might come up with your own thing. Again, flexible. It pays off to be flexible. Uh, peer programming, another awesome, very obvious mentoring opportunity sometimes. Uh, if you're not familiar, this is the act of working on real code together. The last example was more working on trivial problems and kind of just that uh, go work on and come back and compare mentality. This is the act of uh, two or even more people working on real life code together. So you're actually tackling that problem of building the onboarding, the new employee solution or whatever it is that you're working on. Uh, Mark Krauss did a really good session, I think in 2019 at this conference, on uh, peer programming. It was just 45 minutes on peer programming. There's a huge rabbit hole you can dive into here. Um, and so uh, go check that out if you, you see the rest of the slide and you go, oh, that's for me. Uh, you might be going, peer programming, how am I, I can just wheel up two chairs to one computer, um, but I work in Redmond and my teammate works in San Francisco. That's a really long way to wheel a chair. How about VS Live Share, Visual Studio Live Share? It's an extension for Visual Studio Code and for Visual Studio on both platforms, like Mac, Linux, uh, Windows, any miss, uh, mix and match combination of those OSs and VS Code and Visual Studio. As long as you have the VS Live Share extension, it's like, have you ever worked on like a Google Doc or a Word Online Doc and you see multiple cursors in the same document and you can all type at the same time? It's like that, but in a code editor. And so uh, you can kind of even see on the background there, like there's an Amanda Silver um, cursor flag 
because presumably there's more people than just Amanda working on this file. Uh, that it's so valuable, especially when you're in geographically dispersed areas or when maybe you're just in two separate offices, but you've got an ergonomic chair you don't want to wheel on. Um, it uh, is safe as well. I should touch on that. Like it's not uploading your private code to a third party server. This is a peer to peer connection. There's encryption and authentication. It's not just anybody who knows your IP can connect. Um, so there's a safety element here. You should feel comfortable using it. Um, and uh, you don't need all the prerequisites. If there's one person who hosts and another person who joins, as long as the host is able to run that code, uh, you can both debug it. So you get the full experience. It's like a remote dev container, if you've ever used those, uh, where it just happens to be running on the other person's computer. So I can be running uh, my Linux terminal or my Linux OS and with VS Code, and my partner can be running Windows with PowerShell 5.1 that I can't have on my Linux computer, but I can still debug because it's remote and it uh, abstracts that all the way for me. Enough of a pitch for VS Live Show. You're all sold. Uh, importantly, again, I told you this was gonna be a theme. You must both be engaged here. This is not the time where, oh yeah, okay, so I'm uh, sitting here, I'm gonna write all the code, they're gonna watch me. No, they're not. They're gonna open their phone, they're gonna find something else to do, uh, and it's not gonna happen. Uh, conversely, this isn't the time to just sit there idly, scrolling through Instagram, waiting for them to ask you a question. This is collaboration time. Think about, uh, ever been on a road trip and you're driving? What's the passenger responsible for? Having naps and ignoring you, right? No, the passenger's responsible for navigation. The passenger's are gonna hook you up with snacks when you need it. They're engaged in a part of this. They may not be driving, but they're responsible for making sure you don't miss the exit. They're responsible for helping keep the wheels on this thing and make the operation go more smoothly. Telling you things that you didn't already know as the driver that help you be more successful. You might be the one driving. You might be the one taking charge and they might be trying to learn more of your uh, techniques and solutions. Or you might be the one taking the backseat role and helping them practice and acting as those guardrails to keep them on track, keep them from making any dire mistakes and guiding them along that process. And again, being deliberate about that rather than just letting it happen to you is very valuable. It's, uh, if you just let these mentorship relationships happen organically, you'll probably have a little success just being mindful of it, but being active, engaged, and deliberate about it is going to multiply your success. One-on-one uh, -on -one meetings are exactly what they sound like. Uh, these are more the official mentorship relationship. Um, you can have them um, uh, either on a schedule or ad hoc or whatever. You can have an agenda or no agenda. Uh, but the point here is, you're, you might have this with your boss. They might consider themselves your mentor and you're having these deliberate weekly meetings to talk about your career goals and that's really valuable. Um, likewise, you might be having regular meetings with people uh, on your team to see how their career progression is going. But one idea that if you were in a DIL session in this room uh, just previous to this, the, there's an idea of circular mentorship where uh, I have peers, who don't work on my team, who don't even work at my company that I can connect with and I can ask them questions like, I'm really challenged by my boss or by my coworker or by this piece of code or whatever and get that outside perspective on where the person you're talking to isn't invested in their relationship with your boss. They're not really invested in the relationship with that code being successful. They're invested in your success. They're unbiased in every other way and they're trustworthy. They, you, they don't know these people. They know you. They care about you. They want you to have success. And having regular me meetings with people like that online, or it doesn't have to be like really deliberate either, uh, can be hugely valuable. Just to get that outside perspective, that non-agenda bearing perspective where they want you to be successful. And then guess what? What goes around comes around. You'll have an opportunity to talk to them about something that, that's on their mind and it's really useful. Uh, it's really valuable. It's had an extraordinary impact on my career and on uh, other people that I talk to. Finding that sort of uh, nucleus of friends can be the type of thing that lasts your entire career. Uh, again, phenomenally valuable, uh, not to be overlooked. How do you find those people? Well, talk to someone at lunch. 
put away the laptop, put away the phone, sit at a table that has people that you don't already know, and just, hi, who are you people? Do you want to talk about stuff? And it's not to say that every, are you my best friend? Are you my best friend? Like, no, come on, let's be reasonable. But you're at a great place to meet people you don't already know. You're, everybody's hyper-connected. You pull out your phone and there's, a, you have, how many different apps do you have where people could contact you on, right? Like you're accessible, they're accessible. You're both in tech. I don't know, it's just meant to be, obviously. You don't jive with somebody? Well, there's more lunches, there's more dinners, there's more vendor events. There's a, you don't find somebody here that you really click with? Well, there's an entire internet of people out there that you might click with. But if you're just deliberate about it, you'll find your tribe eventually. Uh, some other ideas, uh, we won't go as in depth into this, blogging is fantastic. Uh, this was hugely pivotal in my own career. Uh, a lot of people have a similar experience as me uh, just with the notoriety that they get from being a prolific blogger has helped them in their career. And again, we're sharing the, like we are trying to get ahead in our career, but we're also helping people by sharing this knowledge. Embed some analytics on your site and see how many people come. You'll be surprised, you, like hundreds of people view your post every month on opening a file dialog box on PowerShell or something. Who knew there were so many people that I was able to help by doing that? Um, people found me on my blog and that's how I ended up working at Microsoft. I was solicited to apply for a position because everything I was writing about was really closely aligned with what they were about to hire a person to do. You want to apply? And it worked out. Uh, speaking in public, I mean, obviously I'm a fan. Uh, this is a one-to-many relationship. I'm not building close personal mentorship bonds with each of you right now. And if you think we are, there might be a little bit of a serial killer vibe. But um, this is impactful uh, selfishly for me. This looks good when I go and tell my boss about all of the people that I was able to talk about uh, being better mentors. Just like your mission is to make the people around you better by teaching them, I'm excited to teach you folks a little bit about mentorship. And so obviously I'm going to go back to my boss and report there's a room full of however many people. If they all mentor five people, that's like 500 people I mentored. I'm so great. Like, not so much, but uh, this is a good way to get in front of a room of people and share knowledge that you have that some of them may know, some of them don't. But again, impact. Impact as a developer is how you get ahead as a developer. Uh, activity on social media, this one is by far the most accessible to everybody. If you have a phone, a computer, and an internet connection, you can do this one easily. You probably even have accounts on these sites like Facebook or Twitter or Mastodon or wherever. Um, and it's just, oh, I only get like one like, oh, nobody sees my stuff. Keep doing it. If you put out a tweet and five people see it and four of them were helped, where else do you get to go and say, or talk to four people and help them? We kind of get blinded by these big numbers. Oh, there's this tech influ. Mark Rasunovich just got 400 retweets on this thing. I'm never going to get that many. Well, if you said something in a room full of 20 people and they all gave you a thumbs up, you feel pretty good about that. Well, that's 20 likes on your post. It's just abstracted away and we get uh, screwy with all these numbers and everything. Uh, so again, being active on social media, everybody can do it. Uh, it, and so you may have heard this analogy before, and it's sort of fundamental for the entire thing. Seeking a bigger slice of a small pie versus trying to make the pie bigger. What am I talking about? In this example, pie is credit for the work that was done. Whatever the impact of the script you wrote, whatever the impact of the solution that was delivered, there is a hypothetical, poorly defined, finite amount of credit that goes around for that. You can either choose to be the rock star who takes all the credit for that work that went in and get 80% of a little bit of credit, or you can try really hard to uh, make sure everyone around you is getting credit for that work. And the, you go, well, why do I want to give this credit away? I'm, I, this is called getting ahead, by the way. I'm trying to get ahead here. Uh, when you're that force multiplier on your team, when you're the, like, you can be 120% of a good dev, and that's great. That's really high achieving, the, the 10x dev type stuff. Or if you make five people 50% better, again, we're making up weird numbers just for the sake of doing mathematical examples. But do you get the picture I'm painting here? If you're the person who makes 10 people better, that is better than being the person who's just really good on their own. Uh, of course, 
Uh, blueberry <laughs> pies, uh, no, I'm just like, <laughs> we're running low on time. Again, make sure you get credit for the work you do. That's, that's just fair. That's part of being an employee in an organization who has performance reviews and a boss that expects things of them. But make sure everybody else is getting credit for their work. When you're having those regular conversations with your boss, it's not about going and saying, oh, I taught Billy everything Billy knows. Oh, I taught Samantha everything they know, and I'm so happy about that. It's, oh, you know what? Billy and Samantha did really well on this thing that we talked about that was really rewarding. They're doing so great, I'm excited for them. And it's that kind of natural interaction that they go, your boss will click and go, oh, wow, Thomas is helping these people achieve. Uh, because if your impact is empowering others to grow, that's really good. This is how you start helping other people write more concise code. This is how people start going and refactoring their old code and improving it based on your feedback. And you start counting those negative lines of code and all of a sudden you're under zero and you're in that territory of being an effective mentor and helping everybody around you succeed. And that's not to say you can stop doing your job. You have to keep doing your job and writing the code and doing the thing and clicking the buttons and delivering the things you're supposed to deliver. But if you're also the person who, hey, I, worked, I did two years on this team and I really helped their culture and, oh, and I got them all up to speed on Git and that was awesome. And then I did two and a half years on this team and it's kind of the same thing. Not that you want to career hop every two years, but when you have that reputation of not just being the hired gun who's really effective, but of um, making everybody around you better. People will seek you out. You'll build that reputation. You'll be cold called for uh, to solicit your application for jobs or whatever. You'll uh, be more likely to get that promotion or that new opportunity You'll to get ahead. So, what now? You're going to become a mentor, obviously. You already are. We covered that in like the first couple of slides. You all remember. Um, you're going to stop counting lines of code, even though that was the entire premise of this talk. Because you're gonna be thinking about how do I make people effective? How do I improve the lives of others, both through the code that I write and the knowledge that I distribute? And you're gonna delete code because it's really satisfying. So uh, that's the totality of things I have for you today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and that you're all very excited to go mentor people when you get home.